This is CBC Here and Now. Suspicious death. Has another woman been murdered in this province? We're the top user of antibiotics. Who's to blame, patients or doctors? No, this is not about money. This is not good practice of medicine. He's a bit older and he's a bit of a leader and he's had a lot of experience in the NHL. Teddy Purcell hopes playing in Russia gets him on the road to the Olympics. Well, some sunshine in the mix for most over the next couple of days, but a system tracking over the Grand Banks will keep clouds, showers, even some wet flurries in the mix for the southeast. The details are coming up. A popular walking trail in St. John's was the scene of a gruesome discovery on Saturday morning. A woman's body was found in a meadow not far from O'Brien Farm Road. Here now is Ryan Cook joins us from the scene of what police are calling a suspicious death. So Ryan, what can you tell us about this discovery? Well, Anthony, as you can see behind me here, police are still holding the scene. Some 60 hours after a body was discovered on Saturday morning, that discovery was made by a member of the public at around 8 a.m. And police said it did not appear that the body had been there for very long. Now, uh, a, a few hours after that, just after 1 p.m., Rover Search and Rescue started to arrive on scene. They set up their massive mobile command truck here, and at one point they had more than a dozen searchers joining them. They were briefed by police and then headed out along the sides of this road up into the meadow, and uh, the, the searchers were told to look for evidence, anything they thought might be related to the woman ending up here. Now, we do not yet have confirmation of the identity of the woman, but we do know that a positive ID was made on Saturday night. Next of kin were notified. Speculation was uh, was swirling online Saturday that this might finally be closure for the family of Courtney Lake, but we now know that the body is not that of the 24-year-old mother. Now, police have told us that for the integrity of the investigation, as well as out of respect for the family, they won't be sharing uh, her identity at this time or even her age, but they do stress that there is no cause for public concern here. And Ryan, what are residents in the area saying about this? Well, Debbie, they're, they're pretty concerned, and I think rightfully so. I went around door to door knocking on Saturday, asking people you know, what, what they knew about what was going on here. And a lot of people have told me that they knew more from CBC reports than they did from the police coming to their doors. Uh, they, they, it was that lack of information that worried them. It led some to ponder if this was maybe a jogger or a walker or even a neighbor. But again, police are stressing that there is no cause for concern to public safety here. We still don't know if her body was dumped here or if the woman actually died here. And an autopsy cannot be completed until tomorrow since today was a holiday. So it looks like tomorrow could be the earliest that we would get an update and the earliest that this could possibly be upgraded to a homicide investigation, at which point we would be looking at another woman murdered in Newfoundland and Labrador. Reporting live for Here and Now in St. John's, I'm Ryan Cook. Now, as you just heard Ryan report, initially there was speculation that the body found over the weekend was that of missing 24-year-old Courtney Lake. Police quickly dispelled those rumours. And once again, Courtney Lake's family and their supporters were out searching today. They've been scouring wooded areas across the Avalon for months now. Searchers combed the Cox Marsh Road area of Torbay. This after going through a nearby area of RCAF Road on Saturday. The young mother was last seen in June. Police have ruled the case a homicide. While the search for Lake's body continues, police are set to give an update on their investigation tomorrow morning. Lake's mother is also expected to speak. And of course, CBCNL will be following that police uh, update tomorrow morning on our website and the CBC Facebook page. Now, a vehicle traveling the wrong way was involved in a fatal highway collision on the weekend. About 1 o'clock Saturday morning, the RCMP had a report of a vehicle traveling west in the eastbound lane of the TCH. While they were responding, a second report came in about a two-vehicle accident at the overpass of the Hodgewater Line exit near Mackesons. A 32-year-old man who was driving one of the vehicles died at the scene. There's no word on which vehicle he was in. Two other people were injured. The Department of National Defense says it's doing everything it can to get Goose Bay's airport back to normal. A problem with the sealant put down on the runway's pavement this year caused all flights to be cancelled for more than two full days last week. 
The military flew in a piece of equipment all the way from Comox, British Columbia to help try to speed things up. It's grinding the bad sealant down to a point where it's no longer a concern. Though the main runway remains closed, all the scheduled flights are managing to make it in and out of the airport on a secondary runway. Working every option we have available to us to have this uh, come to a satisfactory outcome. The timeline, we don't know, but safety is always going to be our primary concern, so we're going to just do everything we can as safely as we can. Former Premier Danny Williams is once again battling the city of St. John's over his Galway development. He says the city is putting up unnecessary and costly roadblocks, and now he's taking the dispute to court. Here now is Carolyn Stokes explains. Construction at the Galway development has been delayed because of another dispute between Danny Williams and the city of St. John's. Williams says the city will give him the building permits he needs under one condition. He has to sign away his right to sue the city, meaning that no matter what happens in the future, he will never be able to take the city to court. If the city is engaged in negligence or it's ultra-virus, it's regulations, or there's misfeasance, or there's bad faith, then we have a right to go to court. And they're saying, no, well, you know, that's great if they can get away with it, but I've got to get a declaration from the court that says they can't. William says he had no choice but to bring the matter to court. It's extremely frustrating. I, you know, I, I have trouble describing to you and to people generally what I'm experiencing down there. We're doing all of this, we're doing it by the book. Every single nut and bolt and piece of pavement has been approved and inspected and has been signed off by the city. And we're doing all that in accordance with their laws and their bylaws and everything else. And all of a sudden, they throw another roadblock. <clears throat> so it keeps, it keeps looking like they're trying to keep pushing the deadlines ahead. Uh, that I cannot understand. It makes no sense. He feels the Galway project is being treated unfairly by city staff, but says he doesn't know why. Kelsey Drive, where all the buildings are, there's some major retail big box stores up there. There's no development agreement for Kelsey Drive. There's none for Hebron Way. There's none, to my knowledge, for Aberdeen Avenue. <clears throat> There's none in East White Hills and many, many more. So why is there an unequal standard being applied to Galway that hasn't been applied everywhere else? The city says it won't comment on legal matters. A court date is expected to be set later this week, and Williams hopes the dispute will be resolved quickly so he can get the project moving again. Carolyn Stokes, CBC News, St. John's. There's something novel growing behind the gathering place in St. John's. The vegetable garden there offers people much more than food. It's giving guests a feeling of pride and actually putting some money in their pockets. Here now is Arianna Kellen brings you their story. It's uh, give me a sense of uh, peace, right, from my everyday thing. Charles Noseworthy has a contagious smile. Perhaps nothing makes him smile brighter than these. Peas. He helped grow them himself. They're huge. See, you got the leaves. Basically, if I get my own spot, I know how to garden, right? Neat rows of wooden boxes filled with color. There's a sense of order in the garden. But the lives of the people inside the gathering place are anything but orderly. People of all ages battling mental illness, some gripped with addiction. The majority are facing both. Charles is a regular at the gathering place. He's been coming here for a couple years, getting a meal, meeting friends, using the public computer. Without it, he'd be lost. Oh, I'd be in a bad spot, you know. What do you mean by being that? Being in trouble or whatever, right? So I'm glad that the gathering place has something to offer, you know what I mean? There is no schedule, no hard commitment. Organizers say it just wouldn't work that way. Try to keep the holes underneath it like that. Mike O'Day started the social enterprise project. He's looked on as guests grew from dismissing the garden to watching it, then working on it. A lot of them didn't have very much in their lives. They, you know, they had struggles in their lives. They had addictions, they had mental illness, they had homelessness. With so many challenges, the ability to feed themselves and their friends is a source of pride. We're gonna make a Caesar salad for the guests today. The gathering place serves 250 to 270 meals daily, six days a week. Registered guests jump from 1,000 people to 1,400 just this summer. Especially with the leafy greens where they cost so much in the supermarket, we're going to try and recycle most of those through our kitchen. It's not just the food. For Charles, one of the most important aspects is the money. 
he makes minimum wage for his work and has the opportunity to sell his goods at a fall fundraising fair. They'll be like a big seller, you know, like make money off all the stuff that I've grown and hopefully sell some more stuff if I plant more, you know what I mean? But when the time comes, Charles doesn't show up. It's important to understand that when people come to the gathering place, it really is in many cases, you know, the end of the line in terms of availability of services programs where you are in your life. And so the ability to, to you know, show up at a particular time on a particular day is really not realistic in, in the lived reality of the guests that come here. There may be no Charles, but his vegetables are a hit. So he still gets paid. His time at the gathering place garden, well spent. Ariana Kelland, CBC News, St. John's. Well, it's too bad he couldn't be there because he seemed to enjoy what he was doing in the garden I so know, much. But sometimes there are no explanations for how people are feeling, right. like Charles at the moment when he was supposed to go. This seems like a very therapeutic program. It's yeah. great. And a dramatic great. increase in number of people mm -hmm. using the gathering place. Mm -hmm. Up next, we look at the suggestion that doctors here may be prescribing more antibiotics than their counterparts in the rest of the country because it brings in more money. Two chefs, three rounds, one great cause. On Tuesday, November 14th, 
CBCNL brings you Feed Demons, a live chef battle in aid of the Community Food Sharing Association. Watch from home on the CBCNL Facebook page or be in the audience at Piatto Pizzeria, Elizabeth Avenue in St. John's. Tickets are $10 plus a non-perishable food item. The action starts at 8 p.m. and it's going to get hot. We appear to be addicted to antibiotics in this province. We have the highest prescription rate of anywhere in the country by a long shot. The cause? Well, one infectious disease specialist says fee-for-service doctors are contributing to the numbers. Here and as Terry Roberts has our report. A common scene in this province. Prescriptions for antibiotics being filled at the local pharmacy. The per capita numbers here 33% higher than in Saskatchewan, the number two prescriber of antibiotics in the country. We'll see more and more uh, simple infections becoming life-threatening. A serious concern for this man. Where we realized that they were very valuable for serious life-threatening infections, they've become overused for minor infections, for viral infections, and even for people that don't even have infections at all. Once a bacteria outsmarts an antibiotic, the drug is no longer useful. Unnecessary use of these drugs is now a global concern, and this province appears to be part of the problem. Demanding patients are partly to blame, but daily also has a strong message for doctors. We, we need to start over looking over the shoulder of doctors and saying, this is not good practice of medicine, you need to change what you're doing. And in a fee-for-service healthcare model, he says quantity might sometimes trump quality. There is an incentive for speed, which is income, uh, to have the patients prescribed and uh, left the clinic more quickly. Where we have a fee-for-service model and the doctor gets paid according to how many patients the doctor sees, uh, the faster they can move, the more money there is to be made. No, this is not about money. This is about uh, education for both physicians and for our patients. Lynn Dwyer is a fee-for-service doctor in St. John's. She's changed her ways. I uh, no longer routinely uh, pre prescribe antibiotics in the office uh, for simple viral upper respiratory tract infections. We are now also learning that a lot of uh, ear infections are viral and we can take a wait and uh, see approach. Uh, minor chest infections, we, again, we can treat them symptomatically, but they don't need an antibiotic. But I'm definitely recommending less antibiotic use. A lot less? A lot, le a lot less, yes. Dwyer would like to see antibiotic use slashed by 50 percent. She acknowledges that will take many months, perhaps years, to achieve. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. Graphic evidence dominated the start of the Brandon Phillips murder trial. There was a video of the shooting, testimony from the victim's wife, and a harrowing account from one of the first responders. In his final moments, Larry Wellman told his wife that he loved her. RNC Constable Barry Reynolds lay in a pool of Wellman's blood, trying to comfort him as they waited for paramedics. The testimony was particularly difficult for Rick Saunders. He was Wellman's lifelong friend. And he spoke with Here and Now's Fred Hutton. Fred is live with us in the studio. Fred. Well, Anthony, the evidence, as you mentioned, is difficult for any of us to watch and listen to. Rick Saunders was friends with Larry Wellman for more than 50 years. And for him, on Friday, it was heartbreaking. I knew Larry since I was uh, seven or eight years old, I guess. We grew up together. Uh, he was a couple of years older than me, and, and I got allowed to play with the bigger boys, but once in a while, you know, we got together for a little game of baseball there on the by the Salvation Army School at the time. And, uh, well, he only lived two doors behind me, so like I said, we knew each other all our lives. Rick Saunders didn't know what to expect when he came to court last Friday. 71? He says nothing could have prepared him for what he heard and saw. Do you miss him? Oh, no, I do. No, I do. Yeah. And hard to watch that video, I'm sure. It was quite difficult. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I don't know what, <laughs> I'm lost for words. I, I don't know what to say about it. That from an almost 40 year veteran of the Corner Brook Fire Department. Saunders, who recently retired, says it was actually Larry Wellman who got him his job. Watching that video and seeing his old friend step in to what appears to be an armed robbery didn't surprise him. Uh, I knew Larry quite well, and 
No, that's something that Larry would have done, I think. You know, it's it, it, it was Larry's nature to help out. And Rick Saunders also told me he remembers salmon fishing and work trips he took with Wellman. He says he wanted to come to St. John's to the courtroom to show support for the family and hopes to come back again in a few weeks' time. Anthony? Thanks, Fred. That's the CBC's Fred Hutton, and that trial resumes tomorrow morning. Up next, we'll explain why hair cuttings at a St. John's salon aren't going on the floor and into the garbage, and that's a good thing. With 10 clubs spread throughout the province and over 450 members, the Mazol Shriners of Newfoundland and Labrador give generously of their time to support children requiring specialized medical care. The Shriners' commitment is a substantial one. No child in this province that can benefit from their service will go untreated. No matter how long or challenging the path of rehabilitation may be, Shriners ensure that each child they serve is empowered physically, emotionally and financially to achieve their maximum potential. 
This weather update is brought to you by the Take Charge Business Efficiency Program. Over 400 businesses have saved energy and taken charge of their bottom line. Find out how you can too. Well, you know, it's time for Ryan, but I have to say, I'm kind of surprised to see you. Yeah, well, he wasn't just taking a long weekend no. because he wasn't here on Friday. Ta-da! Yeah, I was in the emergency room on uh, Friday, <laughs> but uh, I gotta say, feeling better at least, uh, and I, I made sure that the boot went with the suit, so uh, <laughs> yeah. that was my only requirement. Uh, You're gonna have a gray one and a navy one. Yeah, that's yeah. right. I'm gonna have to multicolor. <laughs> um, yeah, a lot of people were asking, uh, synchronized swimming accident? No, uh, unfortunately. No epic story, just a bit of a tumble down yeah. the stairs, missed a step, and so a few pulled tendons, a minor fracture. But, but that, uh, uh, that Frank and Ryan look kind of suits you, the latest in men's footwear <laughs> for the winter. Look out, GQ. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'm glad you're not badly hurt. No, definitely not, and I did uh, uh, get rid of the crutches over the weekend, and it's feeling uh, better every day. So, And yes, Doc, I'm still keeping it elevated uh, throughout the day here. A uh, good part of my day is uh, sitting, so hey, why not? Come in and uh, I'll gradually work our, my way over to the green screen after we show you. And I must say, the one thing I've been saying over and over again, thankfully this did not happen in the winter time. True. Or if I was living in Labrador right now. Okay, not sure we want to see this, but here we go. Oh my. So, of course, uh, Chuck Porter put this uh, together. It's fantastic. And it's uh, basically a little mini dock of his cleanup of the 44 centimeters of snow that was recorded at the airport anyway. 44. I wish the guy that I hired was as fast as this guy. <laughs> wow. It's got a pretty snow big blower, machine there. All set to go. And then less, uh, pr more primitive technology. <laughs> That would be the way Boom. I do it. <laughs> that is a lot of snow for early in the season. Even for Labrador, that's a big whack. It is. Uh, yeah, 44 centimeters is the first good shot. He said two hours later there, the first uh, two hours of many that will be spent uh, snow clearing this winter. <laughs> and the epic shot. <laughs> nice. At least he's got a sense of humor about yeah. it. Thanks a lot, Chuck. <laughs> Only six months. <laughs> Thanks for the reminder, Chuck. Uh, yeah, so uh, again, 44 centimeters in, uh, La in Wabush, and Nain picked up 36 centimeters. Makovic picked up 15 centimeters. Uh, Goose Bay, uh, 5 centimeters. Uh, Blanc Sablon, Blanc, 4 centimeters. And uh, yeah, even down towards the Straits, just a little bit. And as we looked at some of the webcams today, you can check out at stormpost.com. You can see where there are. Uh, there is still a little bit of snow on the ground, even down towards the Straits, even through today. As highs really only reached around the freezing mark. Labrador City, uh, Churchill Falls topped out around minus 3 today. And you can see where we're in the 3, 4, 5 degree range across the island. Current temperatures, if you're heading out, make sure you bundle up. Temperatures yeah, right around the freezing mark. When you factor in the wind chill, it is feeling quite chilly, especially along that northeast coast, minus 5 uh, with that wind chill factor, minus 14 in through Labrador City. And we're watching this front over the next 24 hours or so. That's going to dart down and across the island through the day tomorrow. And then I'll have a wind shift on the go uh, as we roll into the uh, Wednesday, Thursday time period, watching this disturbance, which is moving off the coast of the U.S., and that is going to be bringing some unsettled weather primarily to southeastern parts of the island as we roll towards uh, the middle stages of the week. Here's how it plays out. Note that cloud cover certainly building in. The wind shift to northwesterly through Labrador tonight. Cornerbrook and the west coast watch for some flurry chances early on tomorrow. Even up towards the Bayvert Peninsula, uh, I think it'll be south of the Northern Peninsula, so any flurry chances are wrapped up by 7, 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. Pretty cloudy uh, across most of the island. Again, not ruling out a wet flurry mixing in around the metro region uh, tomorrow morning, as well as temperatures will be hovering around the freezing mark. We'll actually bottom out near minus 3 through the overnight hours then with that southwest wind rebound closer to 0 or plus 1 by the time we're heading off to the bus tomorrow morning. As we roll through the uh, Tuesday morning time period, note the wind shift to northerly through the morning into the early afternoon hours, and that will actually have temperatures either stalling or falling a little bit uh, back into that 3-4 degree range for most of us. 
Best chance of showers tomorrow will be over the southeast Avalon, uh, but not ruling it out for the metro region. And again, looking at a mix of sun and cloud for most tomorrow, it's just the Avalon and the Buren where it's going to hang on a little bit and we will have that extra chance of a shower. Still isolated risk, but the risk is there with temperatures again likely falling back towards three degrees by mid afternoon. Two, three degrees is about all we'll muster across central and western parts of Newfoundland. Again, those flurry chances are in the morning here and into Labrador. Lots of sunshine on the menu, but certainly chilly. Highs near minus 7 or minus 8 in the west and minus 1 in the southeast. As we roll forward, note as we move into the Wednesday time period, that cloud is certainly going to dominate. Chances seeing, still seeing some showers over the Avalon and Buren on Wednesday. That's about it. Everybody else is pretty quiet. Temperatures in the 2 to 3 degree range and minus 3 towards western parts of Labrador just below freezing in Happy Valley Goose Bay. This is where things get interesting. Wednesday night in through Thursday is a system that system tracking over the Grand Banks will bring some better shower chances and yes that pink is the potential for some mixing across the Avalon maybe even Clarenville Bonavista and so keeping a close eye on that Thursday forecast especially the Wednesday night Thursday forecast especially in those morning hours uh, for the Avalon Clarenville Bonavista will keep you posted on that flurries in the west but everybody else again pretty quiet even into Thursday. Thursday. Long range details are still ahead. Debbie and Anthony. Thanks, Ryan. Here's an idea that's uh, not so hair brained. <laughs> A St. John's salon is recycling the hair it cuts. It's pretty resourceful. If it's not going to the landfill, that's good news. Good idea. He played more than 500 NHL games, but now Teddy Purcell is hoping to make Canada's Olympic team from his new base in Russia. Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, it could be a silver lining for hockey player Teddy Purcell. After not signing an NHL contract this year, Teddy opted to play in Russia for the Continental Hockey League. But the right winger from St. John's is now being looked at for a spot on Canada's Olympic team. 
At 32, Teddy Purcell has toiled in the NHL with Los Angeles, Tampa Bay, Edmonton and Florida, more than 500 games. But this year, a tryout with Boston didn't work out. That's when Russia came calling and Teddy packed his bags. Goodbye, NHL. Hello, KHL. I spoke with his dad, Ted, earlier today. Ted, first of all, how did Teddy end up in Omsk, Russia this year? Well, Teddy began the year trying out for the Boston Bruins, and uh, when he was released, he was, um, he was offered a couple of two-way contracts in the NHL, but that would have meant uh, possibly spending a lot of time in the American League and riding the buses, something that he didn't enjoy last year. So he was offered a contract in Omsk, Russia, where uh, he made a, a lot of money, but he also was able to follow his dream of playing for, the, uh, for Canada at the Olympics this year. That is a nice carrot to have dangling in front of any NHL-level uh, player. I understand that uh, Teddy did ask Yarmer Yager uh, what was it like in Omsk where he had played, and they uh, gave him the thumbs up, hey? Oh, indeed he did, you know, and, and uh, it was my suggestion to Teddy to speak to Yarmer. Teddy had only played with him for 15 games in Florida when he was traded from Edmonton, but they became fast friends, you know, and Teddy said, uh, I said, I'm not sure if I'm going to bother him with that. I said, I'll go away. I him. You know, he played a couple of seasons there. And uh, first of all, he said it's a beautiful city. And he said it's a very first class uh, hockey organization. And he also said the women are beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> How is he adjusting to life in Russia? I mean, it's a foreign language that he's being exposed to. I know you've been texting a lot. What's he saying about it? Well, the language is obviously the biggest barrier, but uh, as I found out uh, since he's over there, about 75% of the players on the team speak a certain amount of English, which is great for him because he obviously doesn't speak any Russian. There are five Swedish boys on the team who speak very good English, and there's a couple of the Russian guys, so, you know, that, that's uh, made it a whole lot easier for him. And, and they do have a translator there who can, uh, uh, you know, answer any questions he has of the coach and, and so on. Now, you did mention the Olympics, and uh, Teddy was just in a tournament in Switzerland, finished up yesterday. He got an assist in that game yesterday. Um, what's he saying about the look that uh, they're giving him? Well, he's, you know, he's uh, pretty happy with the way things are going so far. Unfortunately, you know, because the boys have only been together for three games, it's hard to get any chemistry. And uh, Teddy's been moving around, you know, uh, he's on different lines every game. So it was a little, little bit tough to get that chemistry, but he really enjoyed the experience. And there's another tournament coming up in Moscow in December that he hopes to be a part of. I would guess that a lot of the team is probably already picked, you know, in, in their mind. But the, the team is not officially uh, brought forward until the middle of January, I think. So Teddy has got another opportunity in December, hopefully, to show his wares. And, uh, and, and, you know, because he's a bit older and he's a bit of a leader and he's had a lot of experience in the NHL, hopefully, you know, that'll, that'll help him. It is interesting, though, that uh, he's been given this opportunity because the NHLers are not allowed to play. It really was a bit of a stroke of luck for him because, as you say, he's older. There's not many more years left playing, I wouldn't think. No, you're exactly right. And, and you know, um, a after he didn't make the NHL this year, it was very disappointing for him. But the silver lining was the fact that the Olympics are on the horizon and he had an opportunity to make the team. So, you know, if this is, uh, you know, coming toward the end of his career, what, what a great way to finish. Yeah, it certainly would be, right? Oh. Keep her fingers crossed. Do you say until January is when the team? Yeah, the, the, yeah, it'll all be finalized. And as he said, there's another uh, look at Teddy in December, okay. he hopes. Right. So everybody will have their fingers crossed. Wouldn't it be Definitely. nice to have another Newfoundland Olympian? Absolutely. <laughs> Up next, it's back to the gathering place in St. John's to hear about a jewelry making program that pays.
Let's meet our young athlete of the day, and we'd like to introduce eight-year-old Mason Smith from St. John's. Mason's been participating in karate with Max Athletics for almost three years. Yeah, he enjoys it a lot and recently earned his purple belt. Congratulations, and Mason is quite excited to be doing a little more sparring in class. Well, way to go, Mason. You're today's young athlete of the day. Now, before we get to the weather, Ryan, I want you to take us back to summer after showing us Labrador, if that's okay with you, <laughs> okay. Uh, because there was an event, right? We don't tend to think about paddling this time of year, but sure. how's this for a challenge? Yeah, that's right. 80 breast cancer survivors taking on the mighty Gander. The Gander River, that is. Have a look. Paddles up and take it away into the fog. So was that late June? Yep, late June, when those 80 paddlers took on one of the province's most unpredictable waterways. Yeah, the event is called Slay the Gander. It's a 40-kilometer dragon boat challenge that takes three days using five boats. They oh. paddled 10 to 15 kilometers a day, and they slept in tents at night. And it's the focus of a CBC documentary that you can see and read about online at CBCNL called Slay the Gander. <sighs> yeah, Doesn't that look Fabulous. What a time they must have had. Yeah, and good timing is the key to Dragon Boat. I mean, stay in unison. And the reason we're only showing you this now is because the documentary is coming out now, not back in June. So that's right. Check it out online, cbc.ca slash NL. Ah, memories. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and of course, again, are near and dear to your heart, yes. uh, as it is uh, many folks. Uh, uh, as we look across the country, unfortunately, the real theme here. Winter is settling in. Uh, it's actually uh, temperatures have come up a bit uh, out west where you remember last week we were talking about snow and minus 10 temperatures in Fort Mac and Calgary. Well, Calgary above zero right now. Uh, nine in Vancouver. It is uh, temperatures around the freezing mark uh, through uh, southern Manitoba, northwestern parts of uh, Ontario. And you can see Toronto at five degrees. But uh, yeah, cold shot there through the weekend as well with a bit of snow so it's uh, definitely everybody's had a little taste of winter for the most part now uh, again still waiting for our first real shot here across eastern parts of Newfoundland even central and of course back towards uh, the Maritimes as well uh, this is our going to be our feature as we roll towards the latter part of the week a little uh, low will, will come out of this big system that's moving onto the coast of BC and that's going to sail across as we move this week uh, of course the other big system that we're watching is the one that I mentioned earlier which is this low moving into uh, and across the Grand Banks over the next couple of days and we're going to pick things up 24 hours from now. There's Tuesday evening again some shower chances over the Buren, Clarenville, Bonavista, the Avalon through tonight into Wednesday right through the day tomorrow and into Wednesday. It looks like that system will start to really back in and bring us our best precip chances as we roll into the later stages of Wednesday overnight and into Thursday morning. And that is where we will also see the chance of some wet snow mixing in. Uh, we'll keep you posted on that. Flurries also at the same time moving into western parts of Labrador from our next system, which will be moving in from the west. So a quick look at the next three in case you missed it. You can see where temperatures in the minus eight range at tomorrow in the west. But certainly that's the coldest temp on the board as we start to rebound a little bit uh, back towards seasonal for the Wednesday and Thursday time periods with again those precip chances increasing in the east as that system does move in. So that system departs as we move into Friday, but our next system moves in and we are looking at flurry chances through Friday on uh, across the big land. The system then moves into Newfoundland with some showers, maybe some wet flurries over higher elevations of the west on Friday. I think we're dry. Uh, in the east on Friday, if you have any Friday plans uh, across the Avalon. Saturday wet though, and maybe even some wet flurry chances across central back towards uh, uh, eastern parts of Labrador. And the pattern stays active with yet another system rolling in as we roll into the later stages of, stages of Sunday. So it is uh, going to be, yes, active. And temperatures again, kind of riding the seasonal marker just below with shower and flurry chances for pretty much everybody, including the east again Friday night into Saturday. Uh, we're looking at central parts of Newfoundland, best chance of flurries Friday afternoon into Friday night, early Saturday. And western Newfoundland, again, keeping an eye on that forecast for you folks with uh, some flurry chances both tomorrow and again Friday night into Saturday. Uh, for Labrador, again, pretty quiet over the next couple of days, turning unsettled Friday, but those are only flurries in the mix. And then looking quite unsettled for Sunday into Monday. That's your forecast to now. Debbie?
Thanks, Ryan. Well, earlier in the program, you met some of the people behind a new vegetable garden at the Gathering Place in St. John's. Not only is it giving guests a sense of pride and community, the job also pays. Now, while we were at that fall fair in October, we also learned about another program at the Gathering Place, a program that teaches people to make their own jewelry and sell it for a profit. Days that I come down here and I have their rough days and like when I come here and sit down with my friends and the rest of the ladies, like I really, you know, forget like what's going on and I just start to enjoy making jewelry, right? And it's a joy I like to be here and make it, right? Because it, it relieves pressure too. I think it really helps a lot of people here, right? And I think like it's a lot of people look forward to coming here and they enjoy being here, right? And they have a place to come, they know they have a place of comfort. And there's people here, like if there's something going on in their life, they got a lot of comfort here, right? Yeah. So. If it wasn't for the gathering place. I mean, yeah, you get not paid to go. If you want to for that place, where you go, go to your home all day down, sit down. It's not only for the people that. You to come here, you really got to come here, and enjoy everything. They have boutique, they have bingos here, and they have everything here. Yeah. They get involved. You get involved. Out of everything. We have our class on Friday, sometimes we do that too. And I've learned how to make a lot of different jewelry at home. When I'm home, I make different things too, right? Okay. When you come here, you know there's comfort here and there's somebody here just waiting to stretch out their arms and put their arms around you and comfort you, right? Yeah. And that's the best part about it, I think. Like when you get here, you know if, you're, if you need help with anything, like there's always somebody here to help you out. And that's the best, you know, that's what I found. But I found working with those ladies and making beads and just coming and getting together every Thursday, yeah. it's, you know, really great. I met a lot of nice friends. I met a lot of new friends. Turning now to some national news, recently we've brought you plenty of horror stories involving rental properties in this province. Well, tonight we go to Nova Scotia where similar situations are playing out. A landlord had to fight to get a convicted fraudster out of his rental property after she repeatedly failed to pay. As Rosa Marcatelli and CBC's Go Public team found, bad tenants can play a weak system so well they live without paying rent for months. And there is nothing landlords can do about it. Play this like a piano. Landlord Jim Johnson discovered too late that his tenant, Elizabeth Critchley, is a fraudster with more than 120 convictions in three provinces. By the time he found out, check after check bounced. He was out more than $12,000 in rent. Plus, he says, tens of thousands of dollars that he'd loaned her for other things. The problems made worse, Johnson says, by a slow-moving landlord-tenant system. It took three months to deal with his case, allowing the fraudster to continue living in his duplex without paying rent. To say we're financially destroyed is an understatement. While Johnson was doing everything by the book, trying to get his tenant evicted, she was keeping busy. Go Public got a hold of a phony lease signed by a Betty Burns, one of the names she uses, where she's trying to rent out Johnson's property as her own. She was very convincing. Tanya Garrard says she lost $1,100 to the woman when she answered a rental ad. Here's part of a telephone conversation where the woman convinces Garrard her rent deposit has to be cash. I can put it directly into your account. So. I don't even know where my account information and all that is. I don't even know. Do you know what? I opened an account and never used it. I don't, I don't even know if it's still after it. Gerard discovered she'd been taken when her partner pulled the land title that listed Jim Johnson as the owner. The couple showed up at his house to introduce themselves as the new tenants. He was quite floored by that. In Ontario, it's also been a tough go for university student Linda Chai. She's been balancing her studies, a job, and acting as landlord for a house her parents own. He's taking advantage of my kindness. It took her months to get an eviction order for her non-paying tenant, who owed more than $7,000 a man with a history of stiffing landlords. I think the system is actually working in favor of the tenants. Advocates say bad tenants are being given too much time to rectify problems. And the system also leaves landlords waiting too long to get to the tribunal stage where an eviction notice is issued. Many people don't have much sympathy for the landlord, but if, if too many landlords get ripped off too often, then they want higher rents to compensate them for that. Jim Johnson's tenant is finally out. She'll make her next appearance in a Nova Scotia court where she faces new fraud charges.
Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. To Iran now, where the frantic effort to find survivors continues after Sunday night's devastating 7.3 magnitude earthquake along Iran's border with Iraq. Over 400 people are reported dead with over 7,000 injured. But both of those numbers are sure to go up. Rescuers are working around the clock in northwestern Iran where the overwhelming majority of casualties have been recorded. The country's supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, has freed up all available military resources to help. Damage is significant on the Iraqi side of the border as well, where at least seven people are dead and more than 500 injured, all of them in the country's semi-autonomous Kurdish region. Toronto police have located three missing Chinese students who were tricked by a fake kidnapping scam. And it's not the first time this has happened in Canada. Ron Charles reports. The three missing foreign students were the victims of a scam targeting Chinese nationals. Toronto police say the students were contacted by scammers pretending to be Chinese government officials who told them to go into hiding and shut off their phones. Their families in China were then told the students had been kidnapped and ransom had to be paid. Thankfully, um, everything uh, has ended safely in that they weren't harmed, nor was their family. One of the students was found today in Toronto. Police found the other two over the weekend hiding out separately in Montreal. They turned on their phones while they were in waiting and uh, received a large amount of messages indicating you are safe, your family is safe, uh, this is a scam, call police, which in both instances they immediately contacted police um, and they have been located safely and their family back in China is also safe. Over the summer, the RCMP issued warnings about similar frauds in BC's Lower Mainland. Chinese diplomatic missions across Canada have also been publishing warnings. There are more than 100,000 international students from China in Canada, the largest single group of foreign students. They're vulnerable because their English is not very good, they're not familiar with the system, so the scammers are quite sophisticated. They use high-tech, uh, they also use very official looking documents. Cybersecurity experts warn to keep personal identification information to a minimum on social media, which is likely where the scammers pick their targets. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. There is growing pressure on an Alabama Republican to end his bid for a U.S. Senate seat. Roy Moore is now facing allegations of sexual misconduct from yet another woman. Beverly Young Nelson came forward today to say Moore attacked her when she was 16. I tried fighting him off while yelling at him to stop. But instead of stopping, he began squeezing my neck, attempting to force my head onto his crotch. Last week, four women came forward with accusations against Moore. One says she was just 14 when he initiated sexual contact. He was 32 years old at the time. The top Republican in the U.S. Senate spoke out today saying he believes the women making the accusations. Moore has forcefully denied any wrongdoing and vowed to continue his campaign. More than 15,000 scientists have signed on to a warning about the health of the planet. They say everyone needs to change their ways in order to save the Earth. The latest call comes 25 years after a similar warning. 1,500 scientists had signed on to that warning back in 1992. The Oregon State University professor who began this campaign says he took a look at the changes the planet has gone through since then. He says he found alarming declines in several issues of concern. Those include not just climate change, but also dwindling fresh water supplies, as well as the loss of forests. The only improvement he saw was in the state of the ozone layer. All right, our beautiful picture of the day and I'm going to give you a big clue here because this is the tough one. Uh, this is in the Bay of Exploits but uh, bonus points if you can name this location.
Well, welcome back. If you're looking for a job away from the hustle and bustle of life in the city, this may just be the thing for you. Yukon's Eagle Plains Hotel is looking for a new bartender. <laughs> It is remote, located on the Dempster Highway, more than 850 kilometers north of Whitehorse. And the responsibilities are a bit unusual, including monitoring road traffic, covering the fuel pumps, and being on fire prevention duty. Right, but the owner of the hotel says it's probably the nicest bar <laughs> in the territory. <laughs> and apparently, uh, it, oh, comes, wow. it comes with a ghost. And you can get more details and an email address if you're seriously looking to escape society. Uh, go to our website, cbcnews.ca. Look at that. I wonder how many <laughs> patrons per year there. <laughs> it looks like, anyway, stocked anyhow. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's the most important thing. Where do I sign? <laughs> uh, so now, uh, are we going to do viewer picture first, guys? Okay, let's do uh, yeah, our viewer picture of the day, uh, which was, a, again, a fantastic shot taken in the Bay of Exploits. And again, this was a very tough question. Uh, we zoom into, have you ever heard of Charles Brook? No. Up the road from uh, Lewis Port. And again, you can see uh, oh. just a fantastic shot there. Bonnie Burt, thanks so much. Uh, posted that to my Facebook page, and you can do the same as so many others it's are. It's lovely. Mm -hmm. Gorgeous. Nice reflection once again. We've had yeah. a lot of those. Yeah, because the winds have been calm enough to actually get some good reflection shots. Rare yeah, here. Right. <laughs> yeah. Gonna have a different kind of a reflection on the water coming up now though, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. This is crazy. Yeah, before we say goodnight, have to show you uh, one more thing. We've all heard the term uh, cattle boat. Well, how about sheep boat? Uh, this, is, uh, this is a good one. <laughs> sheep in a boat, a lot of sheep in a boat. So you can see it was a busy morning in Lamoline on the south coast. The sheep and lambs that were left out on Allen's Island to graze for the summer were moved back into land. Yeah, and the video of the big move was sent to us by Ashley Forward, who says it's a tradition for the Turpin family from uh, St. Lawrence. Fantastic. So is that your farm guy? Winter wool, winter meat? Uh, both. <laughs> They're practical people. <laughs> uh, and I think we've seen footage of that happening before, uh, maybe yeah. a year ago. Maybe the, they were going out to the island, I think. Uh, but uh, I remember it now because I was wondering. I didn't see, I don't recall this footage, but I do remember them going out, out to yeah. the island. Yeah, I believe that was uh, last spring. Mm -hmm. They look uh, nice and fat and woolly. They look great. <laughs> that's quite the scene, though. You're going to get up there. Wasn't a boat full of sheep coming my way? Yeah, that's right. That's neat. Uh, and I love the, the boat color as well. Beautiful. Yeah. That's our program. Thanks for joining us, everyone. See you tomorrow. Good night. Bye now.